Welcome to the dark forest Jackie and her pals will never bore us Shameless confessions about our obsession Will make us laugh and smile So let's explore the dark forest And dork down for a while Hey, it's Jackie Cation. Welcome to the Dork Forest. You know the websites, JackieCation.com, DorkForest.com, TheDorkForest.com, FamilyPetAncestry.com. You're probably already there. Let's do the credits. Mike Rickberg composed and sang that song with his wife, Sarah, that you just heard. He's going to sing his version of the Mexican hat dance at the end of the program. Patrick Brady is going to fix this audio, and Vilmos works on JackieCation.com, the website. There are many ways to support the show. The Amazon link is one. You can use an Amazon link from JackieCation.com or DorkForest.com to go to Amazon. You order like normal and it supports the show. There is a straight up donation button, PayPal or Venmo to this uh, email address that is mine, Jackie at JackieCation.com, where you can just donate to the show if you like the show a lot. I think PayPal has figured out a way to do a monthly. If you want to go monthly, please do. Other ways to support the show if you want to is you can buy merch. There's Dork Forest t-shirts and all the shirts are union made here in America. So they run a little big. Union Bayside. So if you want to look up their size chart. And then the other merch is my stand-up merch. On JackieCation.com, you can watch me do stand-up. You can look at my schedule and the stand-up merch, a couple of different t-shirts, a couple of different enamel pins, and all my CDs and my DVD. If you want to live stream my DVD, it's over there at ComedyFilmNerds.com. They have a live streaming capability, or you can get a hard copy of the DVD on my website. Oh, there are premium episodes at Bandcamp. The dorkforest.bandcamp.com has probably 10 episodes that were done live. They cost me a couple of bucks to make, so I charge you a couple of bucks. If you've run out of regular episodes, go over to ba- the dorkforest.bandcamp.com and get some more. Other than that, I say this. Let's get into the show. Hey, it's Jackie Cash from in my living room. <laughs> How's it going, Sarah Benicasa? It's going really well. I love your house, and I would like to take it. It's adorable. <laughs> you and the feral cats in my neighborhood would also <laughs> like to take it. Uh, they would like us to move the fuck out, and they are sadly... It's not going to happen. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Me and the cats will just stay outside, like, right. waiting for the moment we can come in <laughs> and feast on your dead bodies, because exactly. that's what I think cats would do. They're... And I would do. Push came to shove. I'd feast on uh, a dead body. Yeah, I'd do it 100%. I'm, I'm reading a, a science fiction novel right now, um, a trilogy, and essentially it's about this. There's these seasons on, on this planet that um, it's very hard uh, to to get. Uh, it, they're, called, they're called the seasons because there's no... You have to stockpile and stuff. And eventually cannibalism becomes a thing. Yeah. And, Donner um, party style. Very much so. Anyway, so... It's the N.K. Jemison. I don't know if you've read the Broken Earth trilogy. No, I fifth, never have, but I, it's been recommended season. to me many, 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 many Allow times. me to add to the pile of that. It's excellent. Okay. Sarah Benincasa. By the it, way, I'll only, oh, sorry to interrupt, I'll only open a podcast talking about cannibalism. Oh, that's fair what, enough. It's a, You read my rider. It's that's, in my rider. It is. That. <laughs> and uh, and have you get the house when we're done. Yeah, do. It's perfect. <laughs> it's awesome. Awesome. And you're on Twitter at Sarah Benincasa, and it's Sarah without an H. Oh, so S A R A. It's Sarah J. I decided to make it weird for people, so it's Sarah J. Benincasa. Because right. little Juliana. Very beautiful. Thank and you. And is is Thank is it you. just Sarah Benincasa dot com? Yeah, it's just Sarah Benin. I decided to mix it up, so it's at Sarah J. <laughs> Benincasa, Sarah J. Benincasa Twitter and Instagram, and then just Sarah Benincasa dot com for right. the dot com for the books and uh, the rest of your yeah. informations. All right. We got a dork room to get to. I'm excited. Let's do it. There's a dude. You were like, you sent me three things. And I was like, (laughs) I don't even know who that guy is. Uh, His name is Frederick Law Olmsted. My number one celebrity crush. Very dead. Very dead. Extremely dead. That is a dead person. Yep. Frederick Law Olmsted. Mm -hmm. Is he also from New Jersey? No, he was from Connecticut. Okay. But East Coast guy. East Coast guy. New England guy. For sure. Is New Jersey considered New England? No, New Jersey's a mid-Atlantic state um, oh, and a giant trash pile, and I love it very, <laughs> very much. Well, you gotta you got to love where you're from, otherwise you hate where you're from. Yeah. And then, uh, and then that just leads to hating yourself. So you just got to make peace with it. I love New Jersey because it, for a lot of different reasons, I mean, I don't live there now. I, I go back a lot. Usually I live in Los Angeles, but I go back um, 
brought, last year I think I was back in New Jersey six times. The year before that I think seven times. Like okay. I go back a lot. And do you stay for at least three to three days to seven days? Yeah, anywhere from three to like fourteen days. Okay, um, depending on how dr- what level of family drama is taking place. <laughs> but it's it's it enables me to. You know, I was I had coffee with a guy recently who was being self-deprecating about being from Alabama. And oh. I said, well, I'm from New Jersey, which mm. is the Alabama of the Northeast. It's true. I mean, there, there's some serious mocking that goes on. Oh, New sure. Jersey, which is weird because the first time I went to New Jersey, I was like, it's gorgeous. What's happened? Yeah, I grew up in the real pretty, uh, the part, the garden state out in farmland, out in the country. There was a game butcher where I lived. There was a lot Is of Is that hunting. someone who hunts and then gets <laughs> game and then you bring it to a butcher? Oh, they do a very sweet, yeah, game butcher. Because you can't just go to like, hey, yo, Salvatore, who's like your regular Italian butcher. You got to go to the game butcher. There's several different kinds of butchers. <laughs> there Little really did I know. Are. I did not know that there was more than one kind of butcher. You would think a butcher would be a butcher. Not a gamer butcher, which is somebody who chops up gamers when it's time to eat them. That's a Circling different... back to cannibalism. Oh, wow. Circling back. <laughs> and but uh, so game butchers are like people who do deer and f- pheasants. Yeah, and stuff, mostly. Or? Yeah, yeah. It was de- a deer. Um, there were people who hunted quail where mm-hmm. I lived. We had wild quail. We had wild turkeys. Definitely lots and lots of white-tailed deer. The, I, I would think the birds would be very specific, just because they're kind of small, mm-hmm. and you could lose a lot of the meat if you didn't know what you were doing. Yeah. So, and that's why I think this the that's game a butcher specific. is so specific. Yeah. Okay. And also, you you know, you'd look out back and you'd see behind the game butcher there there's a there's a draining process the blood draining process sure. it'll turn you vegan i'm sure real quick um but or just, you'll just make peace with yeah it. i think that's what i did i think i was like <laughs> all right that's interesting but yeah lots of deer lots of and and um and Fred Law Olmstead, of course, grew up in a very different time. But you he, know what I love? I love that we've we've gone right to him. I Good love work. A segue. That's it. He's in Connecticut. <laughs> he was in Connecticut, and he actually was um, the town in. In he was he was in a town proper, but it was very easy at that time, and actually now in Connecticut to go out into the hinterlands, which is something that his father and his stepmother did a lot with him and his younger brother, John, um, his uh, dad and his stepmom who raised him. His mom died when he wasn't even four years old. How, when, when, was, when did he live? Let's see, Fred. Oh, I took notes. Oh, good. That, that's <laughs> the way to go because that's a very specific thing. It's very specific. So I let let me. Was extract. it the seventeen hundreds? No, he was in. He was born in the nineteenth century, so in the eighteen hundreds. Okay. And one of my friends said to me today that I was a perfectionist, and I was like, "That is accurate." And I feel like it's really <laughs> playing out right now in front of us. I have a notebook with a mermaid tail on it. Do you feel? Um, do you feel uh, any sort of you ever going to let that go, that perfectionism? You ever going to go, well, it's not going to work out I'm working sometimes. on it. Okay, I'm working oh, yeah, on it. Work in progress. There I got go. a system I'm working. You got a system. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't like, is it a perfect system? That's, of course, the question. I mean, I don't know, but I get free coffee there, so oh, I feel great about it. There we it. go. All right. You got <laughs> oh, free coffee here. 18, yeah. I know. 1822. He was born in 1822. Okay. The oldest child of, of John Olmsted and Charlotte Olmsted. And okay. When Fred was born, he went, he was called Fred for most of his life by his friends and family. Um, when he was born, it was actually not common for a child in born in the United States of America, relatively young country at that time, to have a middle name. That was something that was kind of posh in English. So this uh-huh. was like a trend, like naming your kid Hannah in 1990 was a trend. <laughs> Shout out to all Frederick Hannahs. Law. Yeah, Why Law? law? I believe Law was, was, it just Law a was a family name. Okay. Law was a family name. You would think it was like, oh, please let him be a lawyer. Please <laughs> get a job. Um, and his baby brother was born when he was about three. And his mom died of a – his mom was uh, what today we would call an evangelical Christian. Pretty yeah. hardcore. And his mom died uh, – In was, Connecticut? Hard to believe at that yeah, point. Yeah. Oh, my God. A bunch she, of bossy magoos. Oh, totally. And she was addicted to laudanum. Oh. And she died of an overdose. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, laudanum, of course, is opium. Uh, it's ma- made of the same stuff. And But here's the crazy thing is that middle name business, I never knew about that, making your name uh, of the, the, it's usually like the maiden name mm-hmm. or a family name is the middle name of somebody. And it is a posh kind of white, whitey magoo kind of, yeah. um, 
what am I thinking of? What what are those uh, white wasp? Product? Wasp. That's it's it. a very waspy thing. That's, and I had not known what a wasp was because it wasn't one. I think uh, you know what one was uh, if you uh, are growing up in it. And uh, yeah. but when I went to college, I met wasps, and I had friends, a bunch of friends who had their middle names were their were their family names. And then I met Andy Foley Ashcraft, who is my husband, and his middle name is his mama's name. That's an amazing. But he, Ashcraft is amazing. Yes, Ashcraft too. is his father. He sounds Foley. like Foley. Like, I almost said Pulitzer Prize. He sounds like a Pulitzer Prize winner, but he also sounds like he came over on the Mayflower. I meant to say Pilgrim. They came over a long, long time ago, and they are certainly Whitey Magoos. Uh, <laughs> but they are, and they are not Catholic, but what? they are so Southern. <laughs> They're like Mississippi, Mississippi Southern. Wow. So it is not... It is not, uh, this is not a, a New England intellectual middle name. This is Southern Bell. Um, like his, when I met his family, they, this is a story I have told. They brought, they brought me to the, the cemetery so I could meet all of them. Well, Jacqueline, I mean, <laughs> is your full name Jacqueline? Yes. Jacqueline, you need to know who his you, mama's people are. His mama's people, it turns out, uh, his, his great, great, whatever father landed in New Orleans in <gasps> 1861. Guess what happened to him? He became a Confederate soldier. Yeah, well, that's about that's exactly the that's that's when it was time to become one. That specific year. Well, you didn't. If he would have Jesus. landed in New York City in 1861, he would have become a Union soldier, but he did not. And so uh, Andy's family has um, a long history of overt racism, and some people getting over it. And uh, but it's an interesting. Uh, they're super super southern, and um, but they are uh, at every level human. Have you ever seen the? Have you ever seen the PBS series Finding Your Roots? No, it is wonderful. It's available on these internets. Um, <laughs> hosted by Dr. Henry Louis Gates Jr. It's a wonderful show where uh, different celebrities come to him, and he hosts it, and his team does a deep dive into their genetic history oh, and their personal an- Antique Roadshow did a thing called um, Antique Genealogy. Oh, cool. And there's only like four or five episodes, but it was essentially, it was in sort of the same kind of hall that they would always have an antique roadshow. But you'd show up, you would have sent your DNA off, and oh then you gosh. would meet with a DNA person, and they would tell you uh, what they found out. Surprise! Everybody was a Nazi! <laughs> like you was get Nazi. to learn all the cool right. stuff. The whitest people in the world, your grandparents were black. Oh, yeah. Uh, the my, my family is, uh, we did 23 and Me and, and we did oh, okay. And I have a bunch of my mom's, you know, Sicilian side, the Sicilian dad side. Her dad was Sicilian American. And uh, a lot of 9 11 Republicans on that side, some Trump voters. Sure. And the greatest part was finding out that my grandfather's mother was Arab. She wasn't Italian. She was Arab. And That's she was, it. and people, and you know, Sicily is a land of a lot of. It's right lot there of in mixing. the Mediterranean. Yeah. And Sicily is a, everybody's owned it for a while. Like the Greeks owned it, the Spaniards owned it, the Moors owned it. Like everybody's owned Sicily for a while, right? So, she, so people go, ah, oh, well, yeah, that's most Sicilians. I'm like, no, no, she was an immigrant to Sicily from the Middle East. She was actually from outside Jerusalem. And I had heard that story as a rumor within the family. Psst, psst, everybody psst, was like, psst, whisper, nah. whisper. And everybody was like, nah, it's not, I don't think it's true. And the 23andMe and the Ancestry.com confirmed Agreed. it. She was Arab and she's mm-hmm, from, mm-hmm. Uh, she, her family was Druze, D-R-U-Z-E. So a minority population in the Middle East characterized by... Casey Kasem and Amal Clooney, my cousin. <laughs> so I love, so like anything, I always say, I'm like, anything your people and your family are like prejudiced against. Andy was told. You'll find out. Andy was told that he that he was 1% Native American and we did 23andMe and he found out that he is 100% Whitey Magoo. <laughs> he has, that was a lie. That is a, a bald face lie. Whitey Magoo. He's McGillicuddy. The, he is the whitest of all Welsh, Irish, UK, UK and then some more UK uh, and um, and then we there's no Armenian and um, so my brother and my sister and I all did it and uh, then we have three siblings who didn't but uh, it was it was very disappointing for my brother who's very very Armenian to find out that uh, he's it's mostly Italian it's, really? Yeah, it's like Middle Eastern and me- Mediterranean. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Once you get, you sort of throw a random dart over in that part of the world. Right, it's 24% like, Mediterranean, 24% Middle Eastern, and then uh, 43% um, Irish. And then uh, uh, like a se- whatever's uh, left in Northern Europe, like Norwegian or some sort of thing. And so, uh, but 
what I loved about, uh, I, was, oh, I had something, could have been anything. Discovering um, your roots, like what you loved. Oh, by the way, what I was going to say was Larry David does the show. Okay. And he finds out that he had an ancestor who was a, a Jewish man living in Alabama who uh, was a, in a Confederate soldier and he was, a, uh, I believe he was a slave owner. He oh, wow. like one to two yeah, slaves. Yeah. And he's <laughs> one told to him one to two. And he's like blown away by it, you mm-hmm. know, and obviously like, you know. Uh, Trying to regroup. He's like, you know, he's openly blown away, ashamed and baffled by it. and it, But but I, that's one reason why I love that show. Because right, it's, because of that reveal. Well, it, it gives you those amazing reveals and it also... It, it, it teaches you about American history, about the fact that there there were and are um, a substantial amount of Jews in the American South. And right. That, you know, kind of we the way that we look at populations as being inherently from one place, like Jews are from New York, Italians are from New York. And then they end up in, uh, uh, like, in Florida. Uh, they're for, actually, we kind of, everybody goes all over the place. So it's yeah. a very interesting show. Fascinating. My favorite thing in the Antique Roadshow um Genealogy Rocho, or I think it was Sounds called, awesome. um, was sort of a. He was. He looked like. Um, uh, you just did a. I think a you were miming a banjo. It was. A, it was a guitar, it but he guitar. had the big beard. There were brothers. Like a ZZ Top. He was a ZZ uh-huh. Top looking guy. <laughs> this is a little password. So, uh, <laughs> so ZZ Top looking guy and his wife and kids all come to find out he has done his. He's given them his uh, his DNA. He sits down. ZZ Top guy, super whitey magoo. His wife is black. His children are his, their children. And um, so um, we sit down. The the scientist who sits down with him, genealogist mm-hmm. or whatever that is, um, she is a black woman. And she's like, I now you thought that your grandparents, that one of your grandparents was black. And he goes, yes, that's the story in my family. And she said, we looked all the way back through. And I rarely say this is I've never uh, you're enormously white. <laughs> And he could not have been more disappointed. And I love the look on his wife's face, which was this, are we done? Are we done now? You're white. You are not black. She's probably their whole marriage been like, honey, come on. And he's like really trying to bond. Like with on her some sort of weird kids. heritage thing. He's like, you know, and she's like, no, seriously, no. no. And even if... Guess what's it's happening different. right now? It's You're different. not being followed yeah. around in the store. Exactly. Like how we present is how our experience in the world That's is what you get. how we present. Mm-hmm. And and the we can look at, you know, I can look and I can say, oh, my great grandmother was, was Arab, right? But I don't present as Arab. Nope. So I don't get nobody. I don't. It, I got pulled out of line the other day at the TSA because they said that. Your, my crotch area alarmed, which is a, was an amazing turn of phrase. I don't have any piercings. I have nothing like metal down there, but they did the whole thing. And then we all had a laugh Do you have and any I was ribbon released. Candy or toilets or it's anything? just so powerful. I think it was the aura of my It's an badge. Airbnb down there. It really you, is. It's... You know what? For a long time, it was for free. <laughs> <laughs> the price was my self-esteem. <laughs> and we just like had a charming laugh. And you know, a story like that, like I can tell and crack up. And and then I have how many, you know, I mean, especially coming from a stand-up background. I don't do stand-up that much anymore, but uh, hardly ever, Jesus. But but having come up in stand-up, especially coming up in stand-up during the mid-2000s and beyond, and and with a lot more and more, thank God, Arab-American comedians rising right. to prominence and talking about their experiences. I remember the Arab-American Comedy Festival in New York and things like that. You know, I could tell a story like, ha-ha, or I could tell a story about getting pulled over by a cop and how I got out of it. And it's like, ha-ha, you know, I, I think it's entertaining. And it is on one level. But then I'm like, you know what? This is very specific to me as a, as a white woman in yeah. America. Yeah, yeah. You know? It's, it's the, that row is, is, when I first moved here, I... Um, because my last name is Armenian and I am half Armenian, um, the first person who said to me, so was your mom white? I was like, what just happened? Uh, my dad thinks he's white. Is that not, uh, is he not white? And, uh, and I guess it's, I mean, my father is pretty dark. I mean, and my bro- my oldest brother lives in Tucson, and they're both mistaken for Mexican a lot, or sort of Latino, Just but just because it's Middle Eastern and Mediterranean and, and all of the all of that. But I know that I have been passing for white for quite some time. If 
And passing for white in my case is white. Is the whitest of all white. Yeah, and like in another part of the country where there are no... That's what's so interesting about the Armenian thing because somebody said to me... um, was talking about Kim Kardashian and, and, and her sisters and the concept of appropriating black women's style and things like this. And she said, well, at least they're Armenian, so they're not really white. And I was like, that's so interesting that you would say that because it's just an example of how whiteness is a construct. Because in other parts of the country, Armenians would be white. That's well, And that's the weirdest part of it. Yeah. That, because here... It's so much immigrant because of the waves of immigration that came in, the the Beirutzi Armenians that came in the 70s and 80s, and the Soviet Armenians that came in the 90s and 2000s. And and it's just this, this you know, I, I know that when I first moved here in 97, uh, all of the people at church in Wisconsin, which is full of Armenians, uh, were like, oh, you got to be real careful, real careful of those Beirutzi Armenians. And I was like, what's happening? People um, love dividing themselves. Right, right. Oh, my God. It's like Italians. Like, my grandfather was, his family was considered, because they were Sicilian and darker, and my grandmother's family was lighter, because they were from, you know, like, if if you'd gotten on a plane at that time, which I guess you probably wouldn't have, it would have been like a 45-minute flight. You know, we're talking like New York to Boston in terms of difference, right. but it made a difference. But you look, you look at that rivalry right there, oh, the yeah. New York and Boston route. My ad, my ad, my ad. I'm about to do an ad. Rangers, this is an ad for Scentbird. Remember Scentbird? And I'd like to thank Scentbird for supporting the Dork Forest. These are exotic, like authentic, fancy perfumes is what we're talking about here, okay? Have you ever had someone come up to you and say, you smell amazing? What perfume are you wearing? I rarely have that happen, but I have actually had that happen in the last month because I got some from Scentbird. So whatever scent you may be wearing, you have good taste, you know what you like, but you know that sometimes your great taste can be very expensive. And so you end up with a shelf full of half-used bottles or you've been wearing the same two perfumes for years because you're going out and buying a new one is cost prohibitive or a hassle. With Scentbird, you can mix up your fragrance routine without breaking the bank. Whether it's Tom Ford, Gucci, or Versace, Scentbird.com can keep me smelling and you smelling month after month. Right now, the one that I'm liking is actually a very fancy Dolce Gabbana. But the Dolce Gabbana, Dolce and Gabbana light blue. That's what I like right now. It uh, it's light. It doesn't it doesn't overwhelm anything. Super fun. A Scentbird is a luxury fragrance subscription service for perfumes and colognes. You can discover new perfumes and colognes without buying an entire bottle. 450 designer brands. There's 120 sprays enough to apply more than four times a day for a month. You choose the perfume you want to try, and they send you a 30-day supply, essentially. You try the brands you want, and it is, of course, the real deal. And with an exclusive offer just for Rangers of the Dork Forest, you can get 50% off your first month today. That's $7.50 for your first fragrance. So you go to scentbird.com slash dork for 50% off your first month. Again, that's scentbird, S-C-E-N-T-B-I-R-D dot com slash dork for your first perfume or cologne for just $7.50. Sign up, sign on, smell amazing. Let's get back into the show. So we have gone so far away from Frederick. Well, you know what? Fred designed... The emerald necklace, which sounds dirty, the emerald necklace of of <laughs> we have parks thoughts in, <laughs> in Boston, including the Fens, which used to be uh, where uh, how do you spell Fens? F E N S, and the Fens in Boston used to be famous and maybe still is for being a meetup place for closeted gay men. Oh, to oh. have sexy times, much like the Ramble in Central Park, also designed by Fred Law Olmsted. Oh. There's Loring Park in Minneapolis. Uh, don't know if Fred uh, designed it, I but that's where it um, uh, the, the that was a meetup place for sexy times. Yeah, for, for peoples. There's the 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 legacy of the bathhouses and the parks and the sexy times. And actually, Fred's it's kind of funny because Fred McClaw Olmsted's big guiding philosophy throughout his career as America's first and still most famous landscape architect. Lands- oh, that's what he does. Landscape let's, architect. Let's not bury the lead. Frederick Law Olmsted. Landscape ar- architect. Landscape architect. Okay. And his guiding principle, whether he was helping design the midway at the the Columbian ex- Exhibition, Chicago World's Fair in the 1890s, whether he was designing Central Park, whether he was designing 
with his partner uh, in many of these Calvert Vox uh, Prospect Park in Brooklyn, which he considered to be superior to his design in Central Park. The Emerald Necklace in Boston, the park system in Buffalo, the campuses for Wellesley College, for Stanford really? University, for, oh, tons and tons of places. But his guiding principle was always uh, this kind of egalitarian viewpoint that these should be public green spaces, obviously not for the the universities, but uh, he was very, you know, in Milwaukee, what he designed in terms what of parks What did he design there, in Milwaukee? Um, a huge system of parks there, public parks. It was very important that it be public, that it be a place where the common man could mix and mingle with other people, right, that it right. was access to all, because he truly believed, going back to when he was a kid with his stepmother, who was uh, as religious as his mother had been, but not a laudanum addict, and his dad, who was somewhat religious, that you he know, kept picking religious women. He really, his dad was like, "I know what I'm about." <laughs> so I'm gonna need someone to get me into heaven. Yeah, we're gonna go with these ladies. Yeah, let's. I mean, so they're very uptight and deeply resentful of me. I oh love my god, it. let me get domed <laughs> by these Jesus ladies. So <laughs> they would, but they would. Like, <laughs> They would go on these rambles in the wilderness, and that was where they would, that's where they would relax, where it wasn't all about studying and acting, behaving appropriately and all these things. It was where they could relax and really see the majesty of the night sky, and it was, that's where they chilled out, and... Um, even though it was landscaped, even though it was... Well, this was, this was when he was a kid, so okay. going out into the forest and stuff, getting okay. out of town, and so his philosophy, yes, I see, sorry, I see what you're saying, his philosophy that he brought to designing parks was a lot of these people, especially at this time, are living in slums and tenements. Oh, and right, right. Living in because of the f- industrialization. In and exactly. He was like, "What we need is a clear space we where somebody can space. get some air." These people need to see green things. And his when he designed um, the he helped design. He was not the architect of the White City, uh, which was in the that? Chicago World's Fair, which I believe was eighteen ninety six. Uh, Interesting. So he's in his sixties, still doing this. When he did was he hit? doing the damn thing? When did he hit? Like when did he? St- when was the? When did Central Park happen? Well, our boy Fred was quite busy. Over, oh, sorry, it was 1893 Chicago World's Fair. Okay. Um, our dude Fred starts to, after after being, he was not a dilettante, but he was a child of basically upper middle class privilege. Okay. And his father really doted on him and uh, well, indulged there was sitting around. him a lot. <laughs> well, there was a lot of, one reason I relate to Fred is that it, he took a while to find his thing. <laughs> He's 18. He starts working for, he was like a sickly child. And so his dad feels sorry for him and dotes on him. And clearly, I think probably like really, you know, connects him with the loss of the mother. So his, he's kind of his dad's favorite kid. And the one who's like, I don't know, school's dumb. He loved reading, but was like, eh. And whereas the younger brother's like going to Yale and shit. Oh, okay. So there were two kids in the family. Yes, two boys. And so, so Fred's the older one. So he's 18, which is considered old at that time (laughs) he's like not even going to you know he's just kind of chilling he like starts working in new york he's living in brooklyn he's like ah and then he decides he wants to be a friggin' sailor and his dad's like all right we have seafaring men in our family (laughs) in the past and his stepmom's like jesus christ so he goes on a (laughs) ship exactly she's like jesus christ please (laughs) so he goes on a ship to uh china as a sailor and hates it the cat joins the merchant marine basically yeah he gets on a ship he joins a ship and and the captain's name was Captain Fox, who was later court-martialed for denying provisions to crew. Mm-hmm. He ends up with being ca- on the ship captain by the sociopath, nightmare person, <laughs> goes to China, is like, all right, comes back, is real sick, because the captain was like, you don't need these oranges. <laughs> so he's like, this sucks. So he's just, he gets a farm, his dad buys him a farm, and that doesn't work out, so he gets a different farm, and that doesn't work out. And Fred kind of sucks at farming, but he's very good at designing landscaping. And on Staten Island, he has a farm, where he's in his 20s or so, still not married. He's got this neighbor, George Vanderbilt, who's doing very well. Vanderbilt, Vanderbilt. Oh, Vanderbilt, he Mc- Vanderbilt. Uh-huh. And Vanderbilt is like, man, you're really, like, he's like the mega rich. And then he's like, I got a nice condo, basically. <laughs> and so Fred's Fred helps him landscape his place. And Vanderbilt's like, damn, you're good. I'm going to think about this later and hire you for uh, in Asheville for the Biltmore. But that's in a few decades. Okay. And so... <laughs> He, we hit the 1850s when the dude is in his 30s by now. Okay. Still not married. Can you imagine? Nightmare. Just couldn't find the right girl. Couldn't maybe. find the right girl. He's like, ugh. 
And he starts working for, he was a very good writer, and he mm-hmm. starts working for uh, the New York Daily Times, which later <coughs> just became the New York Times. Okay. And he gets sent on assignment down south. So he's on his like third career by this point. Right, right. He gets sent on assignment down south undercover as a reporter to go to plantations and to interview slave owners and slaves themselves. Very dangerous work. Wow. And he is filing dispatches on the road from this experience. Before he goes, he's like on the fence about slavery. He's yeah, like, yeah. you know what? I think it's bad, but he'd never seen it up close. So it was a theoretical bad. Yeah. And he's like, I think it's bad, yeah. but you know, how are we going to fuck up the entire economy? It's really going to screw up the economy. Right. And like free these- states' rights and shit. And after he goes on that trip, he's like, fuck no. And he becomes this incredibly active abolitionist. Really? And he writes his, his articles are eventually compiled uh, into a book called The Cotton Kingdom, which is released in the UK right as uh, the Civil War breaks out. And it is fundamental in turning British public opinion against American Ah. slavery and leading people to contribute from the UK to um, abolitionist societies. Right, right. Because they were kind of like, we could go either way. I mean, they had abolished slavery a while ago. So they were like, eh. And then they were like, oh, wait, no, this is very terrible. Right. So that really and, – and that time also informed his beliefs about designing parks, about the idea that people of all races, all backgrounds, all genders, all creeds, all colors, et cetera, et cetera, should be able to gather for free in these spaces. Right. That these are free spaces for anyone. Correct. Okay. So he – That's amazing. Yeah. No, it was really incredible. So that's in the 1850s he's doing this. So we're pre-Civil War. Right. Um, but his his writings were are continually popular through the end of the Civil War. So 1850s, he's like, cool. I'm a talented newspaper man. He probably would have won a bunch of awards for it today. And then he's like, but you know what? I still like gardening. So once he's done, he eventually, he um, gets into landscape architecture, which just, they he sort of helped invent that. Um, and he and Calvert Vox, who was an Englishman who came to the United States and had V-O-X? done- V-O-X? V-A-U, V-A-U-X. I always thought it was okay. Vo, but it yeah. is Vox, I have Good. learned. That's because the British like to pronounce all the letters. Yeah, they're like, it's Vox, it's not Vo, we're not <laughs> French, you assholes. We were. We were, Never but mind. not anymore. <laughs> exactly. So they start working together and they eventually enter a competition to design what is going to become Central Park. Oh, wow. And they win the design competition. Excellent. And this is a huge job. Right, because isn't Central Park like 30 blocks? How it's big ginormous. Is? I think it goes from 59th Street to 110th. Right, and then it it's goes real like big. six avenues or three avenues or something, right? It's it's a big-ass park, yeah. It's a big-ass park. I believe Griffith Park in Los Angeles is bigger. It is, I think uh, so, But yeah. that's because uh, when they moved here, parks were the thing. And they were, and there was so much land. They were like, "No, we're not going to want that anyway." Yeah, so, California is so huge. Coming from a small state, New Jersey, I'm always amazed by how much land there is here. Right, and Still. and how one side of it to the other side of it is literally 20 hours in a car. Yeah. So yeah, it is a long <laughs> drive. It isn't like Wisconsin where it's eight hours yeah. max, and that's corner to corner. <laughs> it's very different. Yeah. So. So so they win the they win the contest. They Is win that the their contest. first big thing? That's their first big thing and they win That's the contest. That's a huge thing. I know. To be their first thing. Yeah. It's their first big thing together. Right. I'm sure they and did people's Vo- estates. Yeah, and Vox had done stuff in the UK okay. and and uh Fred had gone to visit France and England to learn more and he had gone on, you know, these walking tours with his younger brother John who still by this point is considered kind of the more together one in the family. Well, the golden child, right. is he? Yeah, he is, but he's sickly. And this comes into play later. John suffers a lot. John's married. John has kids. John's sickly. <laughs> John's got his shit together. Yeah, according but he's to married, society. so it's great. Yeah, yeah. And um, so they get yeah they they and so suddenly they're in charge of this huge thing and they've got a lot of opposition from different factions, different political factions in New York City at the time, infighting guys who are pissed off they didn't get the the contract for Central oh, right. Park because it's also like kind of a huge chunk of change (laughs) like he's getting paid pretty well for this. right they're getting a lot of money from Mm -hmm. the city to do this on the state maybe i don't know but or foundations and all this stuff is there some guff about how much land it is um yeah because they're displacing uh uh, shepherds so people had actually like sheep's what is it called sheep's meadow in central park yeah it was was so called for a reason so there are 
You know, it's, I mean, New York, the, the And what year is this bananas. again? Is this the 70s? 1870s? So this, no, this is actually, let's see, grandma's very excited. <laughs> they won the competition. So 1850s, part of the 1850s, like I think early to middle 1850s, he's in, he's in the South sending these dispatches. Comes back, gets more into landscape architecture. Frederick Law Olmsted and Calvert Vox enter the competition for Central Park sometime in the mid-1850s. And apparently it takes a while for a winner to be picked, but they get picked in 1858. Okay. And that is when I think construction commences fairly swiftly because in 1861, it's mostly built and Frederick Law Olmsted takes a leave from his work, temporary leave in Central Park, and he becomes the executive secretary of the U.S. Sanitary Commission. And they're sort of like a forerunner of the American Red Cross in a sense. They provide... Um, health services to soldiers and he's responsible for like a, oh. a parked <laughs> parked in in harbors flotilla of floating hospitals so this dude's now he's like he like literally got bored being so good at designing parks right he's just knocking it out of the park like he spent so long in his life being considered a bit I of a dilettante to, i don't mean to cast aspersions upon frederick but that sounds like kind of a sweet appointment like to be appointed the head of the hospital boats on on the Hudson. Or oh yeah, he it wasn't is. going to fight. He, no, he know? wasn't going. Well, and he was fifty, but um, but that does sound like a real gravy train too. Like that's a good way to to make some extra cash. Oh yeah, and he wasn't. I mean, he he was. Like, where are the Olmsteads today? Are they just fine? The, I think are the, they all the lacrosse? Family, yeah, the I family. Think, I think they're all like playing lacrosse. Like I the family they, still owns, I believe, is the there crew firm scholarships? That he started. And, yeah. Oh, I'm sure. There's a Frederick Law Olmsted National Historic Site up in Brookline, Massachusetts. Like that was where his first firm was. The okay. First offices, but he actually went through. He was probably. I am not a, a shrink. I am someone uh, who is a uh, has various mental illness issues. But reading about him, he displayed behavior, and in his writings, he was certainly depressed. He was certainly a depressive. Okay, he may have been bipolar. It seems uh. like the way people describe him, he had mental health issues throughout his life. Okay, and people describe him quite often in letters and in various other ways as. Like he would go into what it sounds exactly like a mania of being incredibly productive, would yeah. stay up for days on end, and then he would crash. And yeah. people were very concerned about him at different points, and especially during um, the, uh, the he was only the head of the the sanitary commission for two years. Okay, he resigned in 1863, and part of it was because his health was so fucked up kind like he was so oh yeah and by that point he would have these spells where he would just get so depressed he couldn't leave his office he couldn't leave his room and then you, you flip it and he's going 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 for weeks at a time right right and like he um would he would just live he would just basically live off coffee and whatever whatever he, he was treating himself pretty bad so like, all this stuff isn't new these are yeah. I, I know people who live like that now yeah <laughs> no, definitely it's a terrible life choice from, the, from, from like, the outside to see that from the outside looks incredibly painful and he's also going into these he was very hands-on he's in these hospitals day after day after day so with he's these dying soldiers with, and... with people getting experimental surgeries done on them with no you know anesthesiology no, exactly so and and by this point i should add by this point he has suffered the death of his younger brother, and within a couple years, married the younger brother's widow and adopted the younger brother's uh, kids? three kids. So he's taken on a lot, a lot. Wow, this is the, you feel like, it feels like you buried the lead here. I really uh, did. I think oh, I did. Here's, here's, There's so many leads for this guy. John, 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 Olmstead. the brother dies. John dies. John's gone. How does John die? Oh God! I think I forget if he had he had he was long suffering with something or other, but he got some sort of disease. The kind of thing where they'd be like, "Go to the seaside, you'll be better." Oh, one of those breathing things, like yeah, like a real, yeah, one something. of the old school that still exists in some places. But it, you know, one of those things where if you had enough money and you could go be by the ocean, you could live for a while. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, because you're old ones. One of those. <laughs> <laughs> oh God! And then, and they, but he had three kids with his wife, and so what you're saying is that Frederick Law Olm Olmsted never did marry, really, but he married his wife's his his husband his brother's widow. Yeah, he marries adopted his the three kids, and then they have. 
Oh, they end up having. Then they have two kids of their own. They have three children of their own, and one of them, uh, one of the children dies in infancy. The the baby, I think it was the youngest of the the youngest one, is at one point in New York City riding in a carriage with with the, the infant. I think it was a little boy riding a carriage with the mom. Carriage gets in an accident. I think I think Olmstead's in the accident too, and the baby like. They all get thrown out of the vehicle, right? Right. So the mom miraculously is holding the baby and lands on her back, which right. causes her problems, but the baby's okay. But then the baby dies, uh, I think, like a month later, and they suspect maybe it was undiagnosed internal injuries that oh, they didn't right, know right. about. Yeah, yeah. Um, so this guy's life is pretty intense. He has a he has a very vivid memory that he writes about of what going in and he doesn't go into great detail. He wouldn't talk about his mother's death publicly at least or in letters to people his whole life, but he has a vivid memory of being 3 years old and walking into her deathbed cuz she OD'd on laudanum but she didn't die right away. Oh wow. So this guy has this foundational trauma mm-hmm. and is fucking brilliant and is quote sort of indulged throughout his life by his dad who genuinely loves him. Mm-hmm. Thank God. And like and then the, just has tragedy just tragedy goes through and, hysterical blindness at one point as a youth like he's got a lot of psychosomatic shit going on in the body well, and, and she was probably on laudanum when she was pregnant yeah you're that's a really good point i didn't even think so about that. they did not have kids. psas at that point right i'm sure that this was fetal alcohol syndrome no you're um, probably right yeah it was um that's bananas, though. Yeah, that, that he achieved as much as he did. Yeah, he's. I mean, just blows my mind. This guy was amazing. My ad, my ad, my ad. I'm about to do an ad. Rangers, it's Jackie Cation, and it's another ad for Hello Fresh. Hello Fresh makes conquering the kitchen a reality with deliciously simple recipes. It's a monthly subscription, and you can get meals delivered right to your house, and it's great. You spend less time meal planning and grocery shopping, and you get the time back to do more of what you love. You can cook with your kids. They're all simple, very simple recipes. So they're quickly made under 30 minutes. They call for less than two pots and pans. They require minimal cleanup. And so family dinners are easy and the, everybody can help. So it's kind of fun. They're simple, easy, and delicious. You can get $80 off your first month of HelloFresh if you go to HelloFresh.com slash Dork80, D-O-R-K-80, because it's $80 off a month. It's like receiving eight meals free because you get $20 off your first four boxes. Here's the one that I made not long ago. I like this one. The sweet and smoky pork chops with apple carrot slaw, mashed potatoes, and cherry sauce. It's pork chop. I love a pork chop. And I don't usually like fruit in a pork chop. So I put more fruit in Andy's side than my own. But it was super fast. It comes with everything, by the way. It comes with the protein, which I love. I need it to all in one box if I'm going to make a simple meal that's delicious I don't want to have to go to the grocery store to get more stuff because that's why I've ordered it. Anyway, so there's three plans to choose from. Classic, veggie, and family with the option to switch, obviously. There's fun menu features. There's dinner for lunch, 20-minute meals, gourmet, one-pot wonders. Get out of the recipe rut and start cooking outside of your comfort zone by discovering new delicious recipes. So just so you know, for the monthly service, you receive $80 off your first month of HelloFresh. You go to HelloFresh.com slash Dork80, D-O-R-K, 80, because it's 80 bucks off. It's great. Let's get back into the show. How long did he live? Did he live? So he lived uh, to, let's see, he lived to a, what year? He lived to a ripe old age that I didn't write down, unfortunately. Okay. But what I do know, what's, what's kind of... Um, wild i think and certainly as someone for whom mental illness has and mental health and destigmatizing mental health care and things like that has really been a foundational part of of kind of my own life and my own work his right. final days were spent in um an asylum because he had very he had a lot of dementia by the end oh, okay and was hard to control they really tried their best and and but he was like it, there was only so much that his you know his soon-to-be widow could do oh, okay so she she lived she outlived him she did and okay. the, you know, with their five surviving children yeah and the kids are trying to help and it just became so much because he could you know get violent as sundowning and thing now things that we look at now that we're are more familiar with you What's know sundowning? sundowning is when it happens a lot with um, alzheimer's patients where uh, as if you're in like an Alzheimer's ward, you see it like uh, as they 
as it gets toward the end of the day, um, they specifically near nightfall start to get very agitated. Okay. Um, and so, you know, they didn't have the meds then that they do now and still it's hard now. But anyway. It's very different from what happens when the Hulk is trying to turn back into Bruce Banner. <laughs> exactly. So, sun's There's, getting real low. Sun's everybody wears low. purple sweatpants and it's <laughs> very meaningful. So, well, he dies. Though. I like the riffing. Thank you. You're like, I'm, I'm going to try to keep up here. With I'm the like, I got to talk reference. about sweatpants. But okay. he dies in an asylum that he had designed the grounds for. Okay. He took a very special interest his whole life in doing design for what were called sanitariums because he believed that having green space and walkable grounds would help mentally ill people get better. Which is true, actually. Which is actually true. Yeah, it helps a lot of people. It soothes a lot of people. It, he sounds amazing in the way that that he wasn't... I mean, the the stuff in the 50s when, he, when he's down south interviewing slaves and slave owners and sort of undercover interviewing slave owners. Oh, he could have been killed if they knew who he was really working for and what he was really doing. Do you know who he pro proclaimed working for? I don't know. I think, because I've listened to that. there's a beautiful book about him called Genius of Place. Um, uh, Genius of Place and the author, I'm going to look at the author's name right now because I love it. I listened to it very slowly during a very sad time in my life a few years ago. Okay. Um, and it was great. Justin Martin, Genius of Place, The Life of Frederick Law Olmsted. Okay. Fred, by the way, kind of a babe. Kind of a hot? I've always, a hottie? I've always liked a troubled man, but um, okay. he's, a, he's a handsome dude. L l let's see a photo. All right, um, I'm going to show you. Rangers, what, take this time I'm gonna, okay. to look for a picture of Frederick Law Olmsted. Now, this is Fred as an old man, but he's pretty good looking still. I mean, look well, at that. For that I, I era. I become an older woman, so uh, I'm going to be attracted. Oh, he seems incredible. Yeah, he's this a, a this very a real nice looking look that's about him. That's him in like his late 60s, early 70s, and he's like a handsome dude. Uh, and I will say this about, because um, he, he's got a beard. Mm -hmm. I'm not a huge fan of a beard, but only because I find them scratchy. So if you condition... That's what, and, and of course, it's your face. Do whatever you want. And it's also but, back in the day, so they probably had very special beard things that we don't know what. I'm totally, <laughs> right now, by the way, <laughs> listeners, I'm being a real crazy person, and I'm looking up a photo of him from his youth, because he was okay, mm -hmm. For real, for real. Guys, I don't know if you know this about the old days, but they used to have special beard things, mm -hmm. and it's an important uh, part of Sarah Ben Casa's next album, Magic next book, beard the special beard things. Oh, he's so <laughs> cute. I'm really getting hypnotized here. Hypnotized about uh, uh, what's going down. Like, look at how he looks. He's really. He looks like he's got big eyes, very thoughtful, like a very dramatic hipster. Weirdly face. enough, he looks like uh, John Wilkes Booth or his brother. Oh yeah. Um, he looks like uh, a sexy, troubled actor, murderer, also <laughs> right, a complete banana head and yeah. uh, an and evil, evil person. But his brother, John Wilkes Bruce's brother, not evil, also a great Shakespearean actor. Go see his movies. Mm -hmm. Don't go to John Wilkes Bruce's movies. You could boycott those. Yeah, you can boycott opening weekend for his Marvel <laughs> films. <laughs> and okay, so I think this has been fascinating. I like the idea that there's a because. Here's what I know about the park system in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Mm -hmm. It is one of the largest in the countries, and it is a green space that, uh, for since it was created, I believe in the early in the, in the late 1800s. I'm googling it right now because I'm getting yeah, excited. It. The South Milwaukee, Wisconsin, has something called the Oak Creek Parkway, and it is uh, you cannot build uh, within something like three quarters of a mile from Lake Michigan. From from the from the shoreline, and there is, and that goes all the way from, I I believe South Milwaukee. I don't think it goes into Oak Creek, but whatever. From South Milwaukee up to the city of Milwaukee, and the city of Milwaukee, there's there there's more apartment buildings and stuff planted on that uh, on the lakefront, but still a good quarter of a mile off. They changed the zoning. Um, when money was involved, but in between South Milwaukee and Milwaukee, which is probably, I don't know, a good six miles or more of sh shoreline, there is one apartment building in Cudahy, Wisconsin, and it's called the Cudahy Towers. And my Latin teacher lived there Ooh. in high school. She was very, she was very psyched about it, and she would always explain. She was like, "It's not there because of, it. it's there because of crime." 
She said, there's no reason for it to be there because it's ugly. <laughs> it mars the, the, the view for everyone else. It interrupts any sort of beach work that anyone could have done. I live up high and I face the lake and it's very beautiful. <laughs> and we're like, all right, Miss Pierce, good for you. Go on, Miss Pierce. Well, and he, he designed Lake Park, Riverside Park, and Washington Park. Okay, those are all in the city of Milwaukee, actually. And Lake Park is like the biggest one that he's remembered for the most. Okay. And his design led to the beach with Lincoln Memorial Drive. Okay. Um, and initially, there was a six hole golf course initially. Okay. And um, let's see. There's an 18-hole golf course in Oak Creek Parkway in, in Milwaukee, Ooh. South Milwaukee. That, well, originally, um, Lake Park had... Okay, so East Newbury, Boulev Newbury Boulevard mm -hmm. was 12 blocks from Lake Park to Riverside Park. And it used to have 20-foot-wide sidewalks with a horse lane in the median. Oh, that's fun. And it's it was all, like, you know, everything he did was, like, to make things as accessible as possible beautiful but not snobby yeah and to just provide but available for people who have horses uh to to take their horses on a, on a nice ride and then people who don't have horses there's plenty of green space to picnic and and, and hang mm -hmm. out with your kids and stuff that's neat yeah I, yeah i'm in i'm in favor of, of fred nice i'm a work, big fred. fan of his and i find his whole life trajectory is fascinating and since i was a kid i always was so i mean he you know i wonder if there's statues there there's should gotta be. be. There I'd should go be hang some... out with one. <laughs> hump it. It's fine. Get arrested. You just, you just have your, your hand around his calf. Yeah. You're just like, take a picture of me. This is, this this is my boyfriend. <laughs> you know, Calvert Vox, his business partner, was incredibly, incredibly talented as well. But Olmstead had the connections in with right? society in part because he happened to his dad, you know, some of it, a lot of it was privilege, right? His dad bought him a farm that happened to be a, a small rinky dink farm next to a George smaller. Vanderbilt, <laughs> right? You know? and, and right, and if he's next to George Vanderbilt, it's probably some sort of giant castle space. But a rinky dink farm would probably make a living for other people, right? Yes, like his his family sounds pretty successful, but not Vanderbilt. Successful. They were not gazillionaire successful, right? Right, right. They could like wave to each other at the country club or. Whatever. I just did rooster tea feathers, and my sister called me and she said, "Jackie, one out of every eleven thousand people in the Bay Area is a billionaire." <laughs> and I was like, "I hate that information." And she goes, "I know," and because I saw an ad in a in a bus stop that said. You don't have to be a three comma person to own land in the Bay Area. And I was like, if you are calling yourself a three comma person, I want to murder you. Jump in a lake. Jump Ju in a lake. <laughs> Jump in a hole. And San Francisco is a strip mall with Twitter headquarters as the anchor store. It is, That's what it is. It's so brutal. And so I was talking to the audience each night and I would say, so my sister said to me, you might be performing for billionaires. And then they all, there was the silence. And I was like, and I laughed and laughed because billionaires don't come to comedy shows. We're brought to them on the backs <laughs> of elephants. And yeah, um, we do their bar mitzvahs and bat mitzvahs. No, yes. we do their, God, that sounded anti-Semitic that I said that, but I was about to say, we do their weddings. We do their bachelor parties. We do their bachelor parties. We do their quinces. We'll do it. Well, is there a naming ceremony of some kind? Do we right. go into the woods with you? <laughs> They've got an estate. They can do whatever the fuck they want. They can have anybody they want to right they can fly in beyonce if you have a gajillion dollars and they do and they do. they'll bring in rihanna they'll bring in cardi b they'll bring in whoever and if they're especially weird they will have comedians there right that is super weird i once did uh once did a house who was i with patrick keen maybe uh they the improv booked us it was in calabasas two houses three houses down from the kardashians right 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 and so we went um talk about like sort of you know, when you learn something about privilege and then you can't not see it. Mm -hmm. So we drive up to Calabasas and uh, it's a gated community, which a gated community has a guard at it. And you have to tell them who you're visiting. So I go up and the gated community has a 60 year old, what looks to be retired white cop. And I was like, oh, this is a fabulously wealthy, like a guy to whom 
English is his first language. This is his retirement thing. He will murder all of us. Yeah, he's and like, they were like, let's get white privilege to guard our white privilege. It's, it's exact. And I was like, <laughs> I would not have noticed that. But I would have just been like, they had a guard at the thing and that would have been it. But it, but there's different levels of how creepy your guard is. Yeah. And, uh, and I this was like, this guy has oh, tactical training this is, from the force. He's right. done terrible things. This guy, uh, he used to work for Mossad. This is a lot. So, um, which is funny, actually. Um, Michelle. Um, Pat Collins, Nos- Buteau, McNamara. McNamara, thank you. Uh, so Michelle uh, McNamara was, was on the show many years ago. And she was talking about how, uh, because she did a lot of study into true crime, that they have a very advanced security system on her, at her house. Oh, I'm sure they weren't just rocking nests. They were doing right, real... Right, it wasn't ADT. It right. was just, it was a real thing. Yeah. And she said that she was hanging out with Patton on some movie that he was doing. She was talking to some guy about the, the new system, and she said, yeah, it was like, uh, it's like Mossad level cover. And the guy looked at her and said, oh, did you get Avi to come over? <laughs> and there was a silence. She was like, oh, that's real. I did not know <laughs> that I could get ex Mossad to guard my home. And it turns oh, out yeah. all you have to do is have all of the money. Um, really, we should eat the rich at this juncture. That's the message of today's dork forest. <laughs> I mean, guys. I want to be very rich. Right. I want to eat the rich and then I want their money <laughs> at the same time. I want to absorb it all. Like, If I'm a- you were a billionaire. Oh, yes. Oh, what yes. would you do? Wow. Okay. A lot of things. A lot of things. First of all, painless teeth whitening treatment. Second of all, (laughs) endow scholarships at all my favorite schools. I like that it's number two. That's number two. Uh Third of all, uh, I'm going to buy a bunch of land um, in various places, a la Fred. I'm going to hire the best people in the world to make trails on that land and and be wildlife rangers, managers, or whatever. Right. And that land is going to be accessible to lots and lots of people just to go see it whenever they want to. Right. Like Hearst Castle, but for more people. Yeah, more people. And it's going to be open for camping, and it'll be very well monitored and all that stuff. I'm also going to in, uh, endow more scholarships. It's like as everything I do is going to be alternating with scholarships. Mm-hmm, some of mm-hmm. the other, some of the non-scholarship things are going to be very selfish things, teeth whitening. Other things <laughs> are going to be like. But the thing is, this is here's my of, of all the selfish things that I would want, I cannot imagine being able to spend more than. I, I can't even imagine. Uh, like, I feel fabulously wealthy now. And I live in a tiny house in Van Nuys. But it's we beautiful. own this house. That, and which it's is adorable. Cr- it's, and owning a home in the Los Angeles metro area is insane to me. Well, and here's how it happened. Uh, Andy bought it. And then I Lord married I love him. you, Andy. And uh, I'm looking <laughs> for that. If you're out there and you own a, if you're a homeowner. Or you're thinking about becoming one. I'm and you can afford single. it. single. <laughs> you're single. Sarah, Sarah Benincasa, by the way. Uh, so what are your books? Tell oh, the people. Uh, thank you. My first one is Agora Fabulous, Dispatches from My Bedroom. It's a memoir about agoraphobia and suicidal depression, as well as the healing power of stand-up comedy. <laughs> so it's funny, you guys. It's It'll be funny. fine. It's funny. It's weird. It's funny. Uh, and is it poignant? It is po- poignant. It has the poig. Fuck. And then <laughs> the second one is called Great. It's a young adult novel. I used to call it Teen Lesbo Gatsby. Oh. Now I call it a queer contemporary teen take on The Great Gatsby, inspired by, not based on, because I don't have that kind of money. I don't mm-hmm. have based on mm-hmm. money. I have inspired by money, which is <laughs> zero. Um, and so it's called Great. Yes, it's called Great. So it's kind of my riff. Uh, a response, if you will. Inspired by Great Gatsby. Yeah, which is funny because now some kids, and what I wanted was that the kind of kids that we used to call reluctant readers. So I used Mm -hmm. to be a a high school English teacher. Reluctant readers. I was like, okay, if I write this, maybe this will be kind of like a gateway drug of sorts to the Great Gatsby. Some of these kids are going to have to read it. Hopefully teachers will assign the two. And that's what they've been doing, which is awesome. But sometimes kids email me and try to get me to write their essays for them. I'm like, I'm not doing that. (laughs) Gutsy stuff. Good for them. Yeah. And then the the next book is called DC Trip. That's a novel for adults, but about teens. And then the next book is Real Artists Have Day Jobs, which is nonfiction. So you have two books coming up. One's fiction and one's nonfiction. Let's see. I've got, how many books do I have right now? I have five books published. Okay. And then I don't, I, I, you know, I, I have one right now that I want, well, I haven't written it yet, but I'm. I have a, I'm developing a book proposal for a okay. novel for teens that I oh, want fun. to sell. Yeah. 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 Well, that is fascinating. 
Uh, oh, I kind of want, uh, here's, I was asking about the statue with Fred because, uh, and you sh- Google this actually. I want to know if there's a Fred statue that people can visit. There better be. I'm mad if there isn't. I'd be, I'd be disappointed because the two pictures I've seen of him, that is a, a sort of a, a youngish man. And then as an older man, uh, that's good looking people. That's good statue making people. Yeah, and, I mean, and they don't there's always There's uglier look... people that got statues. Oh, listen to this. Xen- <laughs> Xenofrodakis. Say it ain't so. Xenofrodakis. Yes. Can we assume he's Greek? Maybe. Maybe. Um, he did the... Oh, this makes me really happy. I used to live in Asheville, North Carolina. I have it on my uh, arm. I also... A tattoo of Asheville... I uh, all that's where one of his great masterpieces, the landscape at Biltmore Estate, is. Okay. And Zenos Frodakis uh, mm-hmm, created mm-hmm. the first statue of 19th century Renaissance man, Frederick Law Olmsted. It was commissioned by the North Carolina Arboretum, which is gorgeous. And um, North Carolina Arboretum is that in Asheville? It is in Asheville, North Carolina, the Blue Ridge Court, and it is very. Pr- it is very pretty. Um, hey, Zenos. I'm down for it. I really like you. I think this is cool that you did this. That's excellent. Yes. So uh, that's so great. And I didn't even know it was put up after I left Asheville. But um, I love Asheville very much. I feel like Fred and I, I went to school and dropped out of school in Boston. I lived in New York for many years as a as a teacher and then as a comedian, human. I went to school <laughs> the whole in time. Asheville. Sure. Exactly. So I've... I guess it's hard not to live in a place, a major city in these United States that Frederick Law Olmsted has in some way touched somehow. Right. Um, whether through direct work or through work he's inspired through his descendants. But, uh, you know, I, I feel a connection to him because of those places that I've lived as well. That's amazing. And I, um, this makes me want to look into it. There's not, there's, cause there's currently, uh, there's a new statue in South Milwaukee, Wisconsin. And it's down, it's by the decommissioned uh, train station, which has been turned into a historical landmark. And so, uh, like, I think they have like a uh, farmer's market every mm-hmm. Sunday uh, in the summer. And so they're trying to make this into this space because South Milwaukee is, uh, it's a small town, but it's really just a, it's to be a suburb of Chicago eventually because it's a little over an hour um, from Chicago. And, um, so how far is it from, like, say, the Bronze Fawns? Let's say the Bronze Fawns. It's Fonz probably 30, 25, 30 miles. Okay, my best yeah. friend lives in, she's either in Mequon or in Brown Deer. Oh, Mequon. Mequon? Yeah, Mequon. And, and Gareth Reynolds is from one of those places, too. Okay. Gareth Reynolds of the Dollop. Oh, of the Dollop. That's I've, right. I've talked about this on two podcasts that, for some reason, it's come up that Gareth, and I have not asked Gareth which town he's from, and I, in <laughs> fact, I haven't emailed him in years. The fact that uh, Gareth <laughs> is from Milwaukee is funny, because I've met him twice now, and we've uh, exchanged <laughs> almost no words. Now I'm Googling it, because now I'm like, did I make that up about Gareth? Gareth and I went to uh, Emerson together until I dropped out. Now, we we got, we're going to find out a lot about Gareth Reynolds but let, and Frederick. Oh, sorry, I'm interrupting you. Well, let me just tell you that uh, the statue that they just put up, it's much better than the Bronze Fonz because the Bronze Fonz is neither looks like Henry Winkler or Fonzie. So, I know. I went to see it and I was like, what? But if you get to go to Milwaukee, I go do. to South Milwaukee and you will see the statue of the Crusher which is a guy named Randy Lewandowski, I think his name was. And uh, he was a, a WWE, he was a, he was a professional wrestler, all-star wrestler, when I was a child, back in the 12th century. And uh, he grew up and lived in South Milwaukee, Wisconsin. And he was supposedly, one of the ways he worked out was he would run with kegs of beer. <laughs> that sounds and like so, a very Wisconsin I think he did it work f- more for like the photo ops than for real life working well, then out. you run and, into your heated garage. And then you tap <laughs> that beer and then you drink all of it. Yes. And But so the statue has, a, he has a, like a quarter keg on his shoulder. And, and he's wearing, uh, you know, his... his wrestling trunks and stuff like that and so i never i never really i mean everybody has some story everybody my age and older has some story about meeting him and knowing him but my dad who is not a gossip uh, (laughs) my dad is uh in many ways um a caricature of an old lady but uh he is usually not a gossip guy and he was telling me that uh my stepmother used to cut randy lewandowski's wife's hair the crusher's hair and um, and she would occasionally show up all beat up because <gasps> the crusher beat her. <laughs> Listen, it turns out professional up. sports players who have been taught that uh, to deal with things with violence maybe dealt with things in the home front 
with violence. And I was shocked, even though when I thought about it for about three seconds, yeah, I was starts, no longer shocked. Yeah, it all starts to make sense. You're like, wait a sec. Okay. What does he yep. do? This is the guy that coined the phrase, this isn't going to be a wrestling match. It's going to be a war. That guy hit people? Really? Interesting. Man issues with anger? Interesting. <laughs> uh, Sarah Bencasa, it has, uh, it's, we're, we're close to, to ending it. Any, any final words about Frederick? We could have talked about New Jersey. We could have talked about something called King's Quest. Oh. I don't even know what that oh, is. It was a really fun game from Sierra Online Systems, produced from <laughs> approximately 82 to 97. Interesting. Designed by Roberta Williams, who is the first major and most famous uh, video slash computer game designer who was a lady person. Well, good for her. Yeah, for that's a, a whole person. other conversation. But I, I feel good about one. Fred. Feel I feel good about Fred. I feel like we really learned some stuff about Fred uh, on the landscaping front and on other fronts. Yeah, I I, I just feel a very. I just appreciate him so much. I appreciate how much he did for this country, and I also preserving a lot of open space. Oh yeah, I mean, we wouldn't have. Uh, there's so many memories. That we have, you know, that many of us have from being in in his parks. And also, they occupy a very special place in cultural memory. I mean, how many times has Central Park been on the TV or in the movie? All, yeah, all the time. Mm -hmm. All the time with the thing. Yeah, so, and struggled, he struggled a lot throughout his life, mentally and emotionally. And I am endlessly impressed that he left behind such a legacy. And thank you for having me. This was very special to get to come here and talk about this stuff. You were great. This was great. And Rangers, uh, you know the rules out there. Take care of each other. My hat, my hat, my hat. They're dancing around my hat. <laughs> my hat, my hat, my hat. Well, what do you think of that? If it looks like a Mexican hat dance and it sounds like a Mexican hat dance, it's most likely a Mexican hat dance. So take off your hat and let's dance. Yay! Oh, my God. Thank we. You. Why don't we just call that as the end of the show?